The Bible with and without Jesus. How Jews and Christians read the same stories differently. This book is a wonderful book that we take a deep dive into today. I was actually shocked by some of the information that was brought up by Dr. Amy Jo Levine in this book, but also on this episode. You know, and I only scratched the surface on how deep things really get between how Jews interpreted and understood their scriptures and how Christians reading the same scriptures and sometimes different came to different conclusions how a whole new religion comes from interpretation the changes in language and other deep topics are covered today i really hope you enjoy this to add icing on the cake dr amy joe levine is a rabbi stanley m kessler distinguished professor of new testament and jewish studies at hartford international university for religion and peace She also is the University Professor of New Testament and Jewish Studies, Emerita, Mary Jane Worthen, Professor of Jewish Studies, Emerita, Professor of New Testament Studies, Emerita at Vanderbilt University. Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. I'm the host, Derek Lambert. I'm excited about today's show. Endlessly reading Dr. May I call it AJ Levine? Or what do you want me to call you today? Call me AJ. AJ, awesome. Well, just so everybody knows, her name is Amy Jill Levine, and she has she's a professor. Uh, let me just put it this way: high caliber expert. I, I'm telling you, anyone who knows this, you're probably gonna root for her down in the chat. But also, if you don't know, pay attention to the show today and take the time to get some of the books. Go to the link down in the description right now. Before you even watch this episode, get you a copy of one of her works. The one we're talking about today is The Bible With and Without Jesus. And you're going to understand more as we go as to what that even means, what this book is about. It is a fascinating book to tease you how did the Jews understand it? How do Christians understand it? What are the differences? Maybe you even get an answer of why they thought differently. And it hopefully will bridge interfaith dialogue amongst the groups that are out there from Judaism to Christianity. Maybe we can bridge that gap somewhat and people can better understand the world that we live in and these type of ideas. But she has countless books. I don't think I could go through them all in the lifetime. Maybe, maybe I could. Maybe if that's all I did was focus on her literature. But it's on Amazon. The link's down in the description. She also has many of these books in audio format on Audible. For people like me who drive all the time, please go and listen to her works. The one that we're doing right now, the the Bible with or without Jesus. or and without. And without. It's got to be and rather than an or. That's a good point, too, because we're going to get into this detail. But it is well read. The author who's reading this is doing a fantastic job. So I can't recommend it enough. And with that being said, welcome to Myth Vision. Did I miss anything with my horrible, uh, fickle human uh, intro here, trying my best to introduce you to my audience? (laughs) No, I'm just a Jew who knows a whole lot about Jesus and gets really annoyed when Jews bear false witness against Christians and Christians bear false witness against Jews and people ignore history. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, you definitely know quite a bit. And some of the topics that I figured we'd bring up would be in the vein of the book that uh, you, you know, recently had me read so that we could tell people about this a little more. Why did you write this book? What motivated you to write this specific book? Well, the book is co-authored with Mark V. Brettler, who teaches um, Hebrew Bible at Duke University. Mark and I are the co-editors of something called the Jewish Annotated New Testament, which came out first in 2011 and then again in 2017. And God knows they want to do a third edition. It's like three years out of my life each time. Um, So what the Jewish Annotated did is it gathered a group of Jews. It's kind of like herding cats. Um, uh, About 70 of us, I guess, when we were finally done. 
um, to provide notes to all the books of the New Testament, and then lots and lots of, of user-friendly back essays, like who were the Pharisees, and what was the temple like, and how did purity law function, and what did Jews think about sex, and stuff like that. Um, so that when people read the New Testament, whether for historical reasons or personal reasons or because they want to preach this stuff, uh, they would get Judaism right rather than get Judaism wrong. Um, it seems to me that if you have to make Jesus look good by making Judaism look wrong, something has gone very, very wrong right there, right? Um, so Judaism doesn't have to look bad in order for Jesus to be good. Let's set him in his own context. So we get done with this thing. And then we realize there's so much more that we had to say. Mm. For me personally, I get lots of emails, although now I've, I've got books so I can say, go read this book. Um, dear Professor Levine, if you had just read the Old Testament, which I think is an okay term for Christians to use, if you had just read the Old Testament, you would see that it points to Jesus. It points to Jesus on every page. And then I would write back because I'm very good. I, I try to be nice to people who write to me to say, well, you know, the Jewish community looks at Adam and Eve differently. It looks at Isaiah 53, the suffering servant differently and so on. So Mark and I thought, why don't we just write a book so that when, when people say to us, if you just read the Old Testament, you would see, we could say, well, if you read the Old Testament with Christian lenses, you can see Jesus on every page. But if you take those Christian lenses off and you put on rabbinic lenses or non-Messianic Jewish lenses, you see a bunch of other stuff. Uh, and it's the matter of the perspective that we have. And more than that, if you look at the text in its own historical context, well, it does, it's not like it's Where's Waldo when you can see, oh, Jesus of Nazareth gets mentioned here in Isaiah. Um, so what did these texts mean to the people who first heard them? Because generally, if you tell somebody, you know, a virgin will conceive, that's the Greek, not the Hebrew, a virgin will conceive and bear a child. And you say, 700 years from now, it's going to be all good. Most people don't care, right? If you tell me 700 years from now, we'll get the ecological crisis settled. I'm not even sure we're going to be here 700 years from now, but I really like something done now. So that's the historical question. <clears throat> what did these texts mean in context? That's a long answer for why did we write this book? Yeah, it makes perfect sense, especially when you repeat yourself. And it's like, why not publish something, source it, have great, you know, like go in depth so people understand the reasoning. And you say that in the opening. You're like, look, I want both sides to respectfully disagree and say, okay, look, I get it. At least I get why. Cause it sounds to me, you've had a lot of Christians kind of like not get it. They're like, I don't understand why a Jew can't see Jesus. And then when the Jews are trying to explain this, they're having to kind of unpack so much material. It's re you're, you're kind of uh, repetitive. I'm sure it gets annoying. And so you kind of have to go, okay, at least understand, even if you don't accept it, at least know why we say this. And that's right, but the problem's on the other side as well. Yeah. So that um, for many Jewish people, when a Christian says, well, I can see how the creation narrative includes the Trinity, and the Jews are going, well, no, it doesn't. Um, so there, there's a learning curve on both sides. Um, and the reason we so stress that with and without rather than with or without um, is because we want both readings to, to be shown in their own logic. Mm. Right. So the Jews misunderstand Christianity and Christians misunderstand Jews. And sometimes we misunderstand each other. And if we had a little bit more understanding, things would be just a little bit calmer in the world of religion. That's not a bad thing. Wow. So I want to dive into the book some and get into some of this material that you're doing. We want to tease the audience to go get the work because it's just that good. And one of the things you point out is various interpretations. Of course, they had different Bibles, different texts. There's an issue between even going from the Hebrew to the Greek and how late the Masoretic is and are we using Dead Sea Scrolls. It's just a very complicated, you almost need a degree to really wrap your head around with some sufficient you know, uh, understanding here. But there are various interpretations of the scriptures and maybe a question would be like, why do these interpretations differ? Uh, and you put even in this subtitle for this particular chapter – to, or the section of that chapter is two Jews, three opinions. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought that was fascinating as well. So tell us a little bit about it. Um, there are multiple reasons why we read differently. We being Jews and Christians broadly construed, right? Um, it, the Jews are reading from the Hebrew. Um, and then we have to worry about the Masoretic text, which you mentioned. But at the time of Jesus, there are also the Dead Sea Scrolls, which sometimes differ from the Masoretic text. The early followers of Jesus, when they started writing stuff down that we have, 
um, we're using the Greek translation of the Hebrew. And anytime you translate something, you know, something gets left out that belongs there and something gets dropped in that doesn't belong there because all words have connotations. There's an old Italian proverb that means something like all translators are traitors. And they are. <laughs> you know, like Romeo and Juliet and French is terrific in German. Um, in Yiddish, it's kind of funny. Um, so we're looking at when you use a different translation, you're going to come up with a different reading. You're, you're using the Greek, Isaiah says, a virgin will conceive. You're using the Hebrew, it says, look at that pregnant young lady. There, there's a sort of difference there. Um, and then we can work out how that works out in, in reception history. Um, when we look at the beginning of Genesis, I mean, right at the beginning, do we translate in the beginning, like ex nihilo? Um, or do we translate when in the beginning God created, and like there's something there before that God has to work with? Um, do we see um, the spirit of God hovering over the face of the deep, Ruach Elohim? Um, or do we see a, a mighty wind because the Hebrew ruach can mean wind, breath, spirit, and Elohim, which means God, it can also function as an adjective. Like today we use the term like God awful, like super awful. Well, Elohim can have that godly, but in a powerful way, like mighty wind. So we're even wrestling right at the beginning of Genesis. Um, anytime you translate differently, that's going to cause a, a kind of a, a ripple in the stream. And that ripple becomes bigger and bigger as you get farther and farther downstream. We read um, not only different languages. Um, if you go into a synagogue, you hear the Torah chanted. Well, that makes a difference as opposed to the book being read and that, you know, where are the breaks? Where, where's the emotional rise? There's a difference between reading something on a scroll and reading something in a book. And if that's, my students think that sounds weird, but I say, does it, to them, when you read something online, which is what they do, like they read, they read on their phone, is it different to read a text on a phone than it is different to hold a book in your hand yeah. or a paperback, something that you can just like splay on, you know, on the coffee table, or you go into a church with these big pulpit Bibles with the gilt edges that feel different. And the answer is yes, it does. Um, we read through rabbinic lenses. If we're Jewish, we read the text through the new Testament. If we're Christian um, and that kind of constrains interpretations multiple ways. Um, and Christians generally, generally read the Old Testament as if the whole thing's pointing to Jesus. Right. Um, Jews, it doesn't really point to anywhere. It just kind of talks to itself. And there's there's no goal to it. And we can even see that um, through, through the, the way the books are ordered. So the Old Testament ends with Malachi, which is a prophet, and it predicts the coming of Elijah. So it's kind of like, this is all prophecy. And then you can read the New Testament, and John the Baptist drops into the Elijah role in, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And you go, Oh, promise fulfillment. Makes sense. Well, the Jewish canon tucks the prophets in the middle, and the and the Jewish canon ends with Second Chronicles, which is the edict of, of King Cyrus of Persia saying to the Jews in Babylon, go home. So the analogy that I like to use on this is that um, Christianity is like football. So the kickoff is the Garden of Eden, and it's kind of negative yardage until you get up to Jesus. This is break between <laughs> humanity and divinity because Adam and Eve screwed up. Um, and, and the Jesus story is the 50-yard line, and then you get to the goal, which is the book of Revelation, when Jesus comes home. Football. It's linear. Um, Judaism is baseball. You go into exile, you go home. Um, so we're basically playing on different fields with different teams, with different rules, with different uniforms during different seasons. So if we stop trying to fit the Old Testament to Judaism and the Tanakh into Christianity, but we recognize that these are different texts with different meanings— then we can begin to have a conversation. Wow. <clears throat> That's a mouthful of, it, it's literally making me think of how the development of that difference took place, which is what the experts like you do is you go in and you start to show like where thinking may have started to shift into football from baseball, if that makes sense. And it's just so interesting to, to think about that. But I, I really hope people will go get the book and, and take a deep dive because one of the things about you as we move forward, um, you know, you have Orthodox Jews and Orthodox Jews, in my opinion, right? I come at this critically, will have limitations to some degree, right? Uh, well, the, Moses wrote the first five books. We can't look past that. You are critical. You are um, scholarly in this approach. And what I mean is, is there aren't those limitations in terms of being able to explore these options and what they may actually be insinuating. Because in your book, you talk about Canaanites, for example. 
that's a big taboo. You know, you're not supposed to go there in a lot of circles, uh, but you do. And, and I have to honor that and respect that. You talk about Genesis. And when you said that in Genesis, just to make one little praise of what you said there is both groups could learn something here. Because is this a plethora of Elohim in, in a council of God, you know, and they're in his enthronement room or something? And, mm -hmm. he, you know, what's that say about monotheism in the hard sense, right? Is this henotheism? What's going on? So it's a fascinating thing you said, and I got to commend you for it. Well, it, you don't really have to be a, like a Bible scholar to do this. I mean, if, if, if you just pick up, and you can do this online, um, you get two different versions of the same text because you can get the NIV, the New International Version and the King James Version and the New Revised Standard Version and the New American Bible Revised Edition, which is the Catholic Bible, I mean, whatever. And you start comparing translations and you go, oh, we may have a problem here. All right. So even if you can't do the Hebrew for the the quote unquote Hebrew scriptures or the Aramaic that's included, and you can't do the Greek, you can still do a little bit of this kind of text criticism model. Right. Yeah. Um, it doesn't take a Bible scholar to say, oh, this text ends with the prophets and this text ends with the writings, because once you change the ending, you change the rest of the plot. And we know that from movies, right? Does this ending work? Oh, let's refilm. The audience doesn't like it. Different endings. Wow. Yeah, they kind of push you on that path. So the rearrangement of the text is a conscious move. Um, getting into prophecy, if mm -hmm. I may. Uh, it, well, before we move into prophecy, I just want to mention this. Two Jews, three opinions. Mm -hmm. This this idea, even though you know we, we just dealt with how the Christians view it and how Jews are viewing it, and there's differences, there's not even an agreement amongst Christians, even the early church fathers. They don't agree on everything. Jews don't agree on everything. They try to agree on fundamentals, of course, but like there's a, there's still this like ambiguity. And while Christians like to interpret through the New Testament, there are some that are more orthodox that will say, well, we want to know what the father said or what the church says about the New Testament. So there's still that lens as well. While while rabbinic Judaism may say, what did the rabbis say about the Tanakh that helps us interpret the understanding? And they even argue sometimes online they'll say you know look if you don't have the mishnah if you don't have our writings you will not be able to properly interpret the hebrew bible and this this is a saying sure but think about what proper interpretation means proper interpretation means for this particular community um, if some other community wants to interpret it it might not be a jewish interpretation but that doesn't necessarily delegitimize it um so with Jews, I mean, if, even if you look at the Mishnah, which is actually not a commentary on the Bible, the Mishnah is quite sui generis. It, it does its own thing, and sometimes it tells you what's what's in the text and sometimes not. You really need the Talmud to get that textual connection, um, which is probably more detailed than anybody wants to know. The Mishnah is basically a law code. Um, so what happens in Judaism is Jews can disagree because at the end of the day, we're all still Jews. Um, because Judaism is not just an ism, right? It's not just a religion. It's It's the Jewish people. So if you're a member of a people group um, or citizenship or whatever you want to call that, you have a common language, um, you have a common text, which is your constitution, um, you have a focus on a particular land, you have a sense of a common ancestry. So to be Jewish is kind of like to be Swedish or even like to be American, right? Mm -hmm. Which means at the end of the day, you can disagree and they can't throw you out because you're part of that people group. You're in the family. Now, Christianity is not a people group in the same way. And we can see that already in the beginning of, of the Gospel of John. So when Jesus talks to Nicodemus, this is John chapter 3, and he talks about you have to be born from above or born anew, which born again Christians translate as born again, which is not really the best translation. But in any case, you're not in because you're because of your, your parents and you're not in because of your ethnicity. You're in there because of belief. Mm -hmm. Now, this makes a difference. Because if you get into a tradition by belief, you get out by belief. So more or less in the same way that Christianity invented this idea of getting into a movement by belief, right? They also invented getting out by belief. We would call that heresy. So consequently, Christians don't argue that much because if you argue too much, you're out of the system. <laughs> Jews, we can argue until the Messiah comes, <laughs> comes back because they can't throw us out. So even our heretics are still our heretics. Right. This gets into, oh, man, there's a big... Um, I'm read, uh, just interviewed uh, Katel Buthalo. I hope I'm saying it correctly. She wrote a book, uh, Jews and the Roman Rivals, and she's getting into this whole uh, amazing discussion uh, that I really appreciate. So thank you for that. Let's get into prophecy, if you may. Uh, maybe bring up one of the hot topics you mentioned earlier, Isaiah 53. 
how do the two groups see this and maybe what what is there a way to say what the original, I, I don't know if that's something you do in particular is try to deal with how it was originally understood. Uh, Del Martin, for example, I spoke to him one night on the phone trying to potentially set up an interview and he said, stop trying to figure out what Paul thought. You'll never know what he meant. You'll never know what he thought. And he wanted me to say, he said to me on record, does it really matter why Mozart wrote his, his first symphony or does it matter how people understand what, you know, Mozart symphony means to them. And I'm like, uh, I don't really care for that kind of way of thinking. I'm more interested in wanting to know what it really meant when this was written. And I know that sometimes you can't know that for sure, but I want to try to know. And sure. um, it, it, historians are sometimes better off trying to figure out what a text would have meant to the audience that first received it. Cause now we got more information. Oh, this reminds me of this, or I'm in a particular situation. So clearly Paul is addressing me in my situation in Corinth or in my situation in Rome. Um, it, it Does it matter? The question is, does it matter to whom? Um, right. As an author, um, I, I like it when people say, well, what I, I really didn't understand. I mean, it doesn't happen that often because I try to be pretty clear. But, you know, what, what motivated you to write that? Or what did you have in mind when you were writing this? Or I, I hear in your tone something that sounds angry um, or something that's making light of something. Is that what you intended? So I want to make sure that my intent is clear. Um, but there's always going to be slippage between what I intend to say and what somebody receives. Right? You see that in the classroom. You give a lecture, you think you're clear, and then you get the exams back. And you think, where, where did they get this stuff? Right? Because I didn't say it. Um, or even sometimes in conversations with my husband or with my kids, I'll say something and they'll respond. And it's like, well, that's not that's not what I meant. And the reason, but that's what you said. Right? So interpretation is always going to be a little bit fuzzy. Can we get to the, the author's intent? We can try, but it's always going to be a guess. Mm. Right? We don't know. Um, when it comes to looking at Isaiah 53, another reason why Jews and Christians read differently is because we emphasize different parts of the text. So Isaiah 53, if you're on a church on a lectionary, right? So you're reading certain texts annually or triannually. Um, you're going to get Isaiah 53 a bunch of times. Jews aren't going to hear that read. Right. In some situations, it looks like at one time or another, Isaiah 53 was read in the congregation. But it's not big for us. We don't read Isaiah 714, which is the pregnant young woman story. So because we emphasize different parts of the text, Jews emphasize the Torah, Christians emphasize the prophets. What did it mean originally? I think there might have been somebody who I don't think he dies. I think he's just really suffering. And people look at that suffering and somehow they are transformed by it. Um, and if that strikes us as weird, just look at the sufferings of particular individuals today. And when their suffering comes to mind and takes on national import or global import, and then we suddenly realize we're doing something dreadfully, dreadfully wrong. Right? I think that's what this guy is doing. Um, and his suffering calls us to account. So what happens in the Jewish tradition? This so-called suffering servant, which is not a term Isaiah ever used, and it's not clear that the so-called four servant song should be read together. They only started to be read together because a Bible scholar named Bernard Doom said, oh, let's read them together as servant songs. Um, the traditional Jewish explanation is the suffering servant, <clears throat> excuse me, is the people Israel, brought into exile, and in antiquity, if somebody brought you into exile, you basically disappeared, right? Because the idea of bringing people into exile is that you would um, eventually acculturate or assimilate to the place where you've been dumped or placed in capture, and then you lose your national identity. Right? So what they didn't, they stayed together. Cyrus came and conquered the Babylonians and said to these Jews, go home, and they went home. So the Jewish view is, look at this. Here's a people who were brought into exile. It looked like they had died. They had been suffering. They were humiliated. Their temple was burned down. Uh, the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem. Everything was like really, really bad. And boom, they're back home. And then the Gentile nations would think, wow, that God of Israel must really be something. That doesn't happen. So by witnessing the suffering and then the redemption of the people, Israel, the Gentile nations go, wow, God of Israel? Good job. And that then becomes the traditional reading. And it makes sense 
when we see this in the medieval period, um, you can see this in the medieval commentator Rashi, who saw the destruction of the Jews in the Rhineland by, you know, good Christians, um, and then they persevered. And people would look at their suffering and say, but they're still here and maybe there's a message here. But other Jews said, no, 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 it's Moses or it's Isaiah the prophet himself or it's somebody else. Um, we ended that chapter, Mark and I, by talking about who are the suffering servants today who call us to account. And we give some examples from Catholic thinking about anybody who suffers for a good cause, anybody who suffers and, and we pay attention to their suffering. Um, George Floyd. Uh, the people with with this horrible tainted water in Flint, Michigan. Um, who knows? Most recently, uh, the people who were held hostage um, by this uh, anti-Semitic terrorist in mm -hmm. Texas. Right? And we pay attention. We say maybe we should change the way we do things. Wow! Wow! <laughs> It is interesting uh, the way that everybody's looking at these particular things. And I guess what you do is you bridge this. Everybody's not too far from its significance in a way. Uh, Christians see an individual. It's initially it, it initially may have been an individual. So there's one plus point for the Christian in terms of like getting closer to the original of what it might have meant. Um, but they don't really paint. They're not like reading it that way, saying, what's the original? They're. They're reading it and how does this apply to us? And that's the that's the thing about Christianity I find is there's recontextualization taking place uh, in its own time. And it's not uncommon today. We have Christians reading, Donald Trump did what? Hold on, Revelation 12 says, <laughs> you know what I mean? And they just, they find ways to make everything relevant to the here and now. And just like then, there were probably messianic, apocalyptic minded people and then you had those uh, Orthodox people who said, chill out, stop talking about the end of days. <laughs> or think, think about the Christian move as, as, as an opportunity to double dip so that you can see everything in that text is pointing to Jesus. But that doesn't mean that if you've got something that looks really strong, like the suffering servant in Isaiah 53, to say, OK, I can put a check mark next to it. And now I'm done with that, taken care of. Um, the text can have more than one value. So it can point to Jesus, but it's still there. And it's doing something more, I think, than just pointing to Jesus, right? Maybe it's pointing to the reader today because people who are reading the text as sacred scripture right, are going to say, well, it means this, but it can also mean that. Because if it doesn't mean something to us today, then it's, it really has no function, right? Right. And I think the text ought to be, I don't, I don't think it ought to be a checklist. Been there, done that, get rid of it. So Jesus can say, um, I'm not sure he said it, but he could have said, while he's dying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which is the beginning of Psalm 22. But he's not the only one who have prayed that. And in the Jewish tradition, that that prayer is actually assigned uh, to, to Queen Esther. So, wow. I mean, there's there's lots of usable stuff here. Wow. It's a living scripture to them. It's it's something that is alive to them. And that's what's uh, really interesting. And, right, and to think. Even if you're a fundamental. So I go to an Orthodox synagogue. I was, I'm, I'm so unorthodox. It's just bizarre. But I do go to an Orthodox synagogue. Because I like the people and I like the, I really like the liturgy. I like a full Hebrew liturgy. And I like the Bible discussion. Like, so you talk about the Parsha, the passage of the week. I mean, that's just like the best Bible study ever. Um, so um, I say to my, like my Orthodox friends, as I would to my fundamentalist Christian students, yeah, Moses wrote this, no problem. Why this word rather than that word? And how does this text relate to that text? Mm. Um, so even if you want to hold on to these, these very fundamentalist views, you can still do a whole lot of really, really good Bible reading. Yeah, there's a lot of things. Who's the, you know, this gets into the JEDP documentary hypothesis stuff that you could really go, all right, so who again is Moses's uh, father-in-law or what mountain did they go and get the laws from? Like you could really, you know, kind of point these things out and multiple voices came from Moses here. And it's just fascinating that you do that. So thank you for answering that question. Now, something weird that comes up and I say it's weird because we live in 2021. It's it's not something 22. that we do. Oh, 2022. 2022. Yeah, here I am trying to just say <laughs> in the 2000s and on. Um, you're 100% right. I, I, I hear the logos. You know, this is something that is emphasized in the Gospel of John. Christianity really dives into this whole logos thing. And we have 
Jews don't seem today, at least when I hear them speak, they're not emphasizing this logos. And maybe that's a Hellenistic term that they're probably not too fond of using, but wisdom. And, and there's a strange literature that's on the rise, it seems. So can you educate us just briefly on this, like wisdom logos in Jewish pre-Christian thought, which it might allow people to see like Christianity didn't like one day, all right, boom, everything out of nowhere appears. There's a development, a ground up, bottom up development that's happening in Jewish thought that caused Christianity to come up with these terms or use these ideas. Yeah. Um, how much time do we have? Okay. So I, <laughs> I shall try to do this with some efficiency. So the Gospel of John starts out in Arche in Logos. In the beginning was the Word, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. And uh, so it sounds kind of like Philo, who's a Jewish philosopher from Alexandria, who talks about this, this entity called the Logos, which is connected to God, but also connected to humanity, kind of like a, an intermediary figure. Okay. If you go to the Targum, so what's a Targum? Um, a Targum is an Aramaic translation and paraphrase of the Hebrew text, because it turned out in the first couple of centuries in the common era that not all Jews could speak Hebrew. They spoke Aramaic. So when you had your text being read out in Hebrew, you had to have somebody do the translation. And God loved them. When they did the translation, they also glossed it. So they translated and they said, and this means something, something, something. Well, um, Jews have, have for, for many uh, millennia, um, had a problem with just pronouncing the name of God, right? Because you don't want to take the name of God in vain. So there were lots of circumlocutions. So you don't want to say God, God, God. So you need some other word. Um, very common word that you even hear today is the name, right? So in my synagogue, if you say to somebody, how are you? The response is something like Baruch Hashem, blessed be the name. You know, not so bad under COVID. Um, so we talk about Hashem, the name. Um, but in the Targums, these Aramaic paraphrases, sometimes instead of saying God, and here God is the YHWH, that unpronounceable name of God. Um, uh, instead of saying Hashem, they would sometimes refer to God as Memra. Uh, and Memra is Aramaic for word. And why would they refer to God as word? Because that's how God creates. So the Memra was in the beginning with God because obviously God created through the world. So if you said to an Aramaic speaking Jew, you know, in the beginning was the Memra and the Memra was with God and the Memra was God, the Aramaic speaking Jew would have gone, meh, you know, we, we got this one. Right? Um, what happens? Where wisdom comes in, comes in from the book of Proverbs, chapters one through nine, um, and then from a later text that made it, so this is another problem with Jews and Christians, is we have who, what's in the Old Testament canon, right? The Jews just have the Hebrew stuff, and a bunch of Christians have some Greek stuff, um, Roman Catholics, Anglicans, Eastern Orthodox, like the book of Judith and the book of Susanna and the books of the Maccabees, which is great, side note, because Jews get the holiday of Hanukkah and Christians get the books of the Maccabees. That's just weird. Um, <laughs> So in, in these, these wisdom books, like Proverbs and Wisdom of Solomon, there's this figure called wisdom. Uh, the Hebrew is chokmah, uh, and the Greek is Sophia, like the name Sophia. Yep. Um, and it says that wisdom is, was in the beginning with God, and, and it sort of was a, a co-creator with God. Aha! So there's this other figure who's out there, so what happens? The Logos in the Gospel of John looks kind of like wisdom, who was there at creation, drops into humanity, and sometimes humanity rejects wisdom, so wisdom goes back up, and then wisdom pops back down again. So Jesus, uh, the Logos in the Gospel of John, looks very, very much like Sophia, or Chachma, the Jewish symbol for wisdom. Now, what do you do with that? You can say, oh, it's the feminine side of Jesus. It's, it's the female wisdom. It works in Hebrew. It doesn't work in Greek so well. Uh, it, excuse me. It works in Hebrew and Greek. It doesn't work in Latin so well. Um, or you can say Jesus has co-opted the feminine figure. It just depends upon whether you want, want to read it on the left or the right. So it turns out that there, there's entities up there with God right at the beginning of creation. And you can see that as well. You mentioned this when you move to 126 in Genesis where God says, let us create. And then you got to worry about who that us is. Well, if you're reading the Gospel of John, it's the Holy Spirit and the Logos. Yeah, of course. Why not? And that's how the early church read it. Um, if you're reading from a Jewish context, it depends upon the Jew that you ask, right? Um, if you're reading historically, it probably means that God's taking counsel with the heavenly court because there are a bunch of other gods up there. And we know that because the text tells us that. Um, <laughs> Moses' Song of the Sea, which is actually part of the Jewish liturgy, you know, 
Um, who is like unto you? Micha mocha be'elim Hashem. Hashem. Uh, be'elim means among the gods. And what happens in the, in the prayer books? It gets translated among the mighty. And you know, who the hell are the mighty? There are other gods. <laughs> um, so in the first century, I just said hell. That was probably not. It's right. okay. No, no, no. My, my channel's cool. You're fine. Okay. <laughs> Try to keep my language clean. Um, so what happens is in the first century, even at the time of Jesus, the time of Paul, there are multiple supernatural beings. What do you want to call them? I mean, they're not humans. Um, and it's like today we think there's God up here and there are people down here. And this is like big split, except for Jesus who somehow bridges the gap. Um, well, back then, this, this is like range of like godlike figures, like uh, Sophia, wisdom, or angels, or the Satan who becomes Satan, drops off the the who's this sort of supernatural being who used to be part of the divine court and kind of mucked up. Um, and then you've got hosts of demons, right? Different major demons and little demonlets. So the world is alive with these spiritual beings back then. And we tend today in 2022 not to think that way. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad I know what year we live in now. That's that's the one thing I think I absolutely walked away from this conversation learning is it's 2022. No, seriously, I, I think this was amazing uh, getting into the mindset of how they develop and why that would produce a whole new interpretation and why interpretation through language. And, you know, you talk about the translation to the LXX. I mean, there's this virgins used instead of Alma. And then here you have this whole long issue of what does it really say? And you have Dead Sea Scroll texts that are saying that it's using the Greek, if I'm not mistaken, in this particular passage, where it does say virgin. Um, Dead Sea Scrolls have the big Isaiah scroll, which is in Hebrew, is Alma. Okay, so it is that. There's not a Greek uh, version? And that, it's um, that would be the Septuagint. And when you start getting other Greek translations um, toward the end of the first century, like Aquila and Symmachus um, and Theodosian, they use tech, words like neanus, young woman. All right. So the Septuagint gives us virgin, a virgin, and it gives us the, the verb in the future, okay, we'll conceive. Um, but even then you have to ask, is this a miracle, right? So right. it depends upon where you are. So let's say you're Isaiah and you're out there in the crowd and, you know, here's the king and you're trying to get to the king and whatnot. Um, and you say to the king, see that virgin over there? And you point to a four-year-old child. She will conceive and bear a child. You can presume she's going to grow up first. So what the Greek does is give you a couple more years. Right? So even when we hear a virgin will conceive and bear a child, you know, God willing, so my daughter gets born, she's a virgin. God willing, at some point she will conceive a child. But at that point, she's no longer going to be a virgin as far as I'm aware. Right. Right. Um, so even when we have something that looks like it's the prophecy of a miracle, we have to step back and say, well, is it? Um Isaiah says uh, to the king, I'm going to give you a king says, I don't want a sign. Right. God gives you a sign. You have to do something. I don't want a sign. And I say, I'm going to give you a sign anyway. Right. So is the sign a miracle? Well, according to some church fathers like Justin Martyr, of course, a sign has to be a miracle. Greek would be semia, like semiotics. Right. Um, the Hebrew is ot. Uh, but as, it, uh, circumcision is a sign of the covenant. It's not a miracle. It's an operation. Um, uh, you wear tefillin and phylacteries and you bind them as a sign upon your arm, right? But it's not a miracle. It's just a bunch of leather straps with a little box at the end. So even when we wor use words like sign, are we thinking something that's miraculous or something that signifies something else? Wow. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, the Garden of Eden. I yes. figure I would ask you, like we did earlier with Isaiah 53, and I know this is... <sighs> There's so much exploration. Uh, I've been interviewing other scholars on their thoughts about where they think it was written, when it was written, probably in the time of ba Babylon, uh, because they had gardens and there was literally food for the gods, things like this. There's other people. <laughs> it's not as if Babylonians invented the garden. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm saying that they think that the the text itself, though, is like it has this uh, – well – they learned these ideas, if you will, while they're probably in captivity or they're in Babylon, maybe when it's written. My question would be, maybe you, from your perspective of your research, what do you think it originally is saying? And then, like, can you tell us some different interpretations that, you know, come from various groups from Jews and Christians, maybe even mention Gnostics, because they have a, 
what we call Gnostics. They have a wild mm-hmm. new angle on that, but. Well, everybody's got a wild new angle on it. I mean, most <laughs> Jews actually don't talk about Adam and Eve too much because uh, after Genesis, the first couple of chapters, they pretty much disappear. Um, they start popping back up in that deuterocanonical literature, the wisdom of Jesus ben Sirach, sometimes called Ecclesiasticus. Um, and they come in strong in the New Testament. In Romans 5, Adam messes up, Jesus fixes it. Um, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, Adam was not deceived, right? And I'm thinking the monk is just standing right there. He, she hands him a piece of fruit and he eats, right? He doesn't ask. Um, uh, but first Timothy, he was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. And then you're off to, you know, women get saved by bearing children, which is, that's weird. Mm. Um, so Christians have a, a traditionally have a greater investment in Adam and Eve than Jews do. Um, when you start getting to people like Augustine and the idea of original sin, so Augustine says that because of this, Adam, because of eating the fruit, it's only an apple like in the 12th century. Um, so because of eating the fruit, Adam's seed became vitiated, which kind of means his sperm got a, like a negative genetic marker on it. So that everybody who was conceived the normal way um, is conceived with this taint of original sin. And Jews are going, yeah, I don't think so. Um <laughs> Uh, the rabbinic tradition um, looks at Adam and Eve as clearly having messed up, but very much stresses their repentance. Um, uh, the Genesis Rabbah, um, you know, you made repentance just as your children will make repentance, and and, uh, and I, God, will accept that. Um, as opposed to, this is a sin, it's a major problem, we need Jesus to come and fix it. Um, in Jewish reception history, Adam and Eve are pretty good. Um, there's a book called the book of Tobit, which I really, I feel like canon envy. I really, really like the book of Tobit. It's, again, it's one of those Greek texts. Um, and Tobias, who's the, Tobit's the, the dad. So Tobias is the son. He has an adventure. He's got an angel in disguise protecting him. It's very, very nice. Um, uh, eventually marries his cousin, whose name is Sarah, um, who by the way, has been widowed seven times because a demon who has fallen in love with her keeps killing her kids, her husbands. It's an interesting text. And when they get married, um, Tobit appeals uh, to Adam and Eve as, as you made uh, Eve the helper of the man and brought joy to these people, so bring joy to us. And in the Sheva Brachot, the, um, the seven blessings that are recited over at a Jewish wedding, um, one of the blessings appeals to Adam and Eve and to the joy of the first people. So Adam and Eve, when, it, when they do come into Jewish reception history, generally pretty positive. When they come into Christian reception history, oy, what a mess. Um, <laughs> So again, we choose how to read. And one of the reasons we read differently is because of the different reception histories, whether it's Romans 5 or 1 first, first Timothy 2, or what's happening in something like Genesis Rava. So uh, two things uh, you mentioned briefly in this book about original sin, or, th- or at least this idea, Psalms 51, where, Ad- uh, where David says, I was born in my mother's womb and in iniquity or something to this effect. Yeah. This, so... Um, there is this idea that may have gave birth to Christian thought on these things through the Bible. Can you tell us about that briefly? Is and and, and one one real question in this I'd love to know is, of course, we see Israel's perspective. It, the authors are typically either Jewish or I would say Jewish, most likely, but nonetheless they're Israelites. In what way do Gentiles sin? Because that opens a whole another can of worms. You know, you what, get, what counts as sin? Yeah, what counts as sin? And how do we know biblically through the Hebrew Bible that Gentiles actually sin since they weren't given the law, right? Because Christian polemic is, well, if they weren't given the law, they're not guilty, right? They don't really, they don't know, so they can't yeah. be blamed. Uh, how do we deal with this issue? Well, you've, you've just asked two separate questions. <clears throat> so let yeah. me answer the first, which deals with the psalm, and then I'll, and then remind me what the second one is, because okay. sometimes I just get off on a roll. So you have to you have to pull me back. <laughs> so so we've got this psalm, uh, but it doesn't come into reception history as as anything other than a type of poetry. Um, the psalm is a, a typical um, the the category is the psalm of the lament of an individual, like Psalm twenty two. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And they're generic. I mean, anybody could write one of these things because it's got the same skeletal outline. You begin by saying how crappy things are for you in the present. Um, And that's designed to call God's attention. I'm suffering, pay attention. Um, You remind God that God has done wonderful things for our ancestors. Uh, You say to God, um, uh, I'm in danger right now and you need to save me like you saved people in the past. And you end it by saying, if you do this for me, and of course I know you'll do it for me because you're God and I trust you, I will sing your praises, right? 
Um, so this is a typical, you know, how bad are things? For, they were bad from the moment I was conceived. Right. Boy, I'm in trouble. Right. Uh, <laughs> but it doesn't have any sort, sort of doctrinal sense to it. Um, we start getting an idea of original sin, um, in part because of the translation of Paul's epistle to the Romans, chapter 5, into Latin, um, when we start getting what in omnia peccaverant, in, in, in him, Adam, they sinned, rather because of him, they sinned. And then you start getting that internal biological whatever. And that's the problem with language, right? So how do we know Gentiles are sinning? Uh, you're right. The law code was written for Jews, which is one of the reasons why Paul is telling his Gentile converts, don't get circumcised because that wasn't written for you. You come into the system as Gentiles. I mean, you don't lose your Gentile identity, uh, but you turn away from your gods, right? Your Gentile gods, and you turn toward the God of Israel. Okay. And, and you don't rag on the Jews because you know, God will take care of them. Um, but we do have, and there are various versions of this in antiquity, uh, for Jews, they invented something that we call today the Noahide laws or the Noahide codes, and that's from Noah, right? So um, after Noah gets off the ark, um, God makes a covenant. This is before Noah gets drunk and things go downhill. Yeah. Um, God makes a covenant with Noah, and the covenant is this bow up in the sky. We think about rainbow. It's really like bow, like bow and arrow. So God is, is hanging up the weapon of war. I'm not going to you again, at least by flood. <laughs> Fire next time. Thank you, New Testament. Um, <laughs> so, um, so the idea was that when God makes a covenant, there are usually sort of stipulations to it, right? So what does the covenant mean? So they developed this idea of the Noahide codes, which is, which is sort of like the law code for Gentiles. And it doesn't have anything to do with the Sabbath or circumcision. There's, there are seven of them. Um, and for me, they're kind of like the seven dwarfs, like one of them always goes missing. Oh, you forgot dopey, right? Um, so you can't murder and you can't steal and you can't engage in sexual imp impropriety like adultery or incest, things like that. Um, you have to establish courts of justice because you need to have a just society. Uh, you can't rag on the Jewish God, right? Um, the last one is you can't eat a limb from a living animal. And I forget what the sixth one is, um, but I think it has something to do with worshiping stones or something like that. Um, so they're basically just be a decent human being. Um, don't steal. Don't murder. Don't screw around inappropriately, particularly in situations that would be abusive. Make sure you have a just society. Leave the Jewish God alone. Don't worship what's what's clearly not a God. And don't eat the limb from a living animal because we care about the animal world as well. That may have something to do with what was going on in some pagan temples also. Right. <laughs> that makes, yeah. So when, like, I guess the question is because some people argue the Noahide laws on Gentiles is maybe a later thing. How would Paul have addressed this? Do you think that it's possible? And I'm just speculating here to throw it to you as an expert on the field. Um, do you think that natural law may have played some significance to like the thinking because philo has this what seems to be a cosmopolitan idea of the torah that it's this universal law that somehow fits in with his if i could use the word platonic concept i'm getting really deep in the weeds here to make a point but he, there seems to be some overlap and influence where they're kind of competing in a way with the with the roman world around them and with the Gentile world to say, look, we've got even better. Our God, our laws go all the way back. Our God is the true God. And he is that infinite unmoved mover, you know, like what Plato is kind of getting at. And, and everybody falls under this, um, this template. If, if we take Paul at his words, if we granted that these are his words in Acts 17, which that's a whole nother issue. And he seems to be preaching this universal message Oh, you've got an altar to an unknown God. You're kind of almost there. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know what? It didn't work. It, the sermon the sermon on the Areopagus was a flop. <laughs> so maybe right. so you, might, you might try to speak that language, but it's, it's really not going to work. Right? Um, or at least it's not going to work in Athens. Um, even Philo. Um, Philo's talking to other Jews, um, including these people that we, we call them the radical allegorizers. Oh, you know, don't eat pork means don't behave like a pig, right? You know, have a ham sandwich. It's not just, you know, take take the, the, the allegorical interpretation. And Philo doesn't want to go that far. He wants some practical payout as well. So whenever you have a law, everybody's going to disagree, right? The mm -hmm. law says honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. Don't work. 
And one Jew looks at another and says, what constitutes work? And the next thing you know, you got two synagogues. Um, so <laughs> laws always have to be interpreted. And that's what the rabbinic system does, right? Um, you have to interpret it. You wear this as a sign upon your arm and wear them as frontlets between your eyes and write them upon the doorposts of your house. That's the mezuzah, right? right. What goes into it? How do you hang it? Who gets to hang it? What angle do you hang it on? Right. So once you try to figure all this stuff out, that's when the rabbis come in and they help you. And they usually say, well, rabbi, this does it this way. And rabbi X does it that way. And the sages say this and somebody out in Babylonia does something else. Whatever. As long as you're within the group. Paul, when it comes to natural law, appeals to natural law and he gets it wrong. Right. Um, if we want to talk about natural laws, what does nature teach us? Uh, nature, Paul, right? First Corinthians, does not nature teach you that for a woman to have long hair, it's her pride, but men should have short hair. And you go to the zoo and you go, no, that's not what nature teaches you. Have a look at the lions, have a look at the peacocks. Um, when Paul talks about, and this is hard because we're not exactly, if Paul had it said, can I use the word penis? I've yes. already said that. One. You know, if Paul had said, don't put your penis in the following places, that would be very clear, right? Uh, but in Romans 1, which is one of the so-called clobber passages about um, uh, male homosexual activity. Right. Uh, Paul talks about what's contrary to nature, and he may be talking about um, uh, lesbian activity and male homosexuality. Um, and when you go to nature, it's actually not contrary to nature. Right. Right? Um, so when, and, and by the way, um, Paul in Romans 11, when he's talking about, you know, and all Israel will be saved in Romans 9 to 11, right? Um, uh, and he talks about how these wild olive shoots are grafted onto the olive tree contrary to nature. You know, it's the same term. So in Romans 1, contrary to nature looks like it's a problem. In Romans uh, 11, contrary to nature is what gains Gentile their salvation. So what are you going to do with natural love? People can do stuff that's contrary to nature, and it actually seems to work. <laughs> what a mess. Yeah. <laughs> I've never really thought about that whole Romans 1 to Romans 11 connection on natural law, but that's interesting you point this out. He, he obviously hasn't explored the world very much, so he only is dealing with his local animals, I guess. Um, we do the same thing. So you look at something, oh, that's unnatural. I mean, putting orange with pink. Oh, my God. Um, you know, ketchup-flavored ice cream is unnatural. Yeah. yeah. Different tastes for different people. Um, then there's a parrot that does have those colors connected. <laughs> so when my mother, my mother was born in 1913 uh, in Massachusetts. And when she went to elementary school, to the Betsy B. Winslow Elementary School in New Bedford, which I think is still standing, um, her teacher in first grade tied her left hand behind her back because my mother was a lefty. Um, and to be a lefty in like 1920, was considered to be, that's not right, you know, because it's, it's a right-handed world. So it's to be left-handed was kind of like to be contrary to nature. So today, if some teacher ties your hand behind your back, that's not contrary to nature. That's illegal. <laughs> yes. So at one point, what we considered natural really turns out to be cultural. And that's always going to be a problem because we impose onto our view of nature our own particular values, some of which are inherited, um, and therefore do not understand nature very well because what we think is nature is really culture. So to put it real simple in Paul's mind to answer this one, because I know that that's a difficult one. Paul Fredrickson's written amazing, wonderful works. Uh, you're connected with these wonderful scholars. I hope to see her later this year at her university. She actually said, uh, you don't give up, do you? And I said, no, ma'am, I don't. I really, really want to interview you. I loved her books when, when Christians Paul were Jews. Paul is terrific. And you yes, you should go talk with her. I hope a miracle happens where I can actually go and do that. That's my goal. Um, my question is, what did Gentiles need to be saved from in the context of Paul. Oh, from the wrath that is to come. <laughs> I mean, Paul's apocalyptic. Paul says catalogically, kind of tones it down uh, by the time he writes Romans. And, and for the Deuteropaulines, um, like the pastoral epistles, it's like, yeah, we're going to be here for a while. Let's 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 get bourgeois. Um, uh, God's final judgment. So part of this is this it's the same message that Jesus had, you know, repent and believe. And Paul is saying, OK, so how do you market this Jewish Jesus messianic view? to a group of Gentiles. And you say, you have the option of coming into the covenant and you don't come in via Torah. You don't come in via circumcision, right? You come in by changing from your Gentile ways and worshiping God. And for Paul, and I think this is really optimistic. 
this is how I understand Romans. Paul thinks that, you know, once once you give up your Gentile gods and you join this thing, um, that you have this kind of internal transformation and you move from the realm of Adam, which is the realm of humanity, and for Paul, the realm of sin, um, to the realm of Christ. And because you've now got Christ in your heart, um, you kind of have a moral um, ticker. Um, and because you now have a moral ticker and you have Christ in your heart, you should act accordingly, right? Um, so that because you have Christ in your heart, of course you will love your neighbor as yourself. Um, of course you will provide food to those who are hungry. Um, of course you will not insult your neighbor, but you will work together as part of a common body. I'm using imagery from First Corinthians. Right. Because you have Christ in your heart. And the problem is it doesn't work, right? Which is why Paul has to keep writing all these letters saying, you guys, come on, get with the program. Um, Jews, on the other hand, have Torah. Right. So we don't have to have this internal heart thing. Right. That's Jeremiah. You'll have like the new heart, the new covenant in Jeremiah 31. We're not there yet. So Jews have the Torah and the Torah says you'll always have the poor among you. So extend your hand to the poor and needy. And the prophets say you have to take care of other people. And, you know, you're you are your brother's keeper and you have to love the stranger. And, and the problem is we don't do it. Um so the Jews have a law code, but we don't always follow it. And the Christians have the sense of the Gentile Christians have the sense of internal transformation, but it doesn't always play out in practice. Mm. Sometimes it helps, right. So it helps, I think, to think about each other. Can we think, can Jews think about the sense of an internal transformation? If you, if you really, really believed in God, or if you really, and if, or if you were an, because you can be an atheist Jew, right? Again, we're a people, so we're not held together by belief, but you really believe that Somehow following Torah makes you a better person, which I think it does, right? Because it, it gives you some kind of parameters um, and it gives you urges um, and it gives you um, challenges, right? You're a better person and the world will be a better place if you do that. Can we take that literally to heart? And for Christians, particularly Protestants, who were so antsy and squirrely, oh, it's legalism, you know, he was like earning your way into having don't do good works, right? To say, no, 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 that's what you're supposed to be doing. And if you're not doing it, then you go to the epistle of James, which says faith, faith without works is also dead. <laughs> so who cares what you believe unless it cashes out? Bingo. That's why Jews and Christians should talk with each other, because we've got different mechanisms for being better people and making the world a better place. Thank you so much for that answer. I appreciate it. Uh, priesthood. So you have a chapter, a whole chapter. It's, I really was mesmerized because I recently interviewed uh, Harold Attridge, who wrote oh. the Hermene on Hebrews. Yeah. And I loved getting into that. I interviewed him on this channel, of course, and we dove into this. But your chapter five is about priesthood, especially Hebrews, uh, Melchizedek yes. and and supersessionism. So can we touch on this? You go deep into it. I don't want to get you lost because I know you could really get into this. But let's first mention Melchizedek. Who was Melchizedek? Um, Jewish interpretation and thought of him. And then, of course, the, the Christian understanding and maybe if you have an original, what can we know of what initially maybe? <laughs> That's the tough part. That's the one where it's like a huge question mark. And oh, then we'll move to know what his name means. Yeah. You know, I mean, it could be named after a pagan god. It could mean king of righteousness, which is Melky Zedek. Um, we don't know what his name means. He shows up in Genesis 14 and then he pops into Psalm 110. And Psalm 110, just in Hebrew, is an entire mess and nobody really knows what it means. And, you know, people make careers out of trying to translate this thing. Um, and in Genesis 14, um, he he hooks up with Abraham and it, it looks like Abraham pays tithes to him. OK, well, that's pretty impressive. And he's a priest king. Um, so what happens uh, in Psalm 110, we have a reference to a priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, like Melchizedek set up this priestly succession, except that only works in the Greek. It doesn't work in the Hebrew. What a mess. So by the time you get to the New Testament in the epistle to the Hebrews, which I have to explain to my students, Jews don't read and they go, but it's the epistle to the Hebrews. Yes, but it's in the New Testament canon. Um, Hebrews says that Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek which is how Jesus can serve as the high priest in the heavenly altar, because this is good pl pl Platonism, right? You have this accidental stuff here, like altars and whatnot, but up in heaven is the real deal where there's a new Jerusalem. You can see that in Revelation, right? Because Jerusalem then drops down. There's a new Jerusalem up there, and there's a heavenly temple, and Jesus is serving as high priest at the heavenly altar, and he can't do it legally because he's not from a priestly tribe. He's from the family of David, from the tribe of Judah. And in order to be a priest, you have to be from the tribe of Levi because Jews know these things. Right. Sort of like saying uh, your ancestor had to have come over on the Mayflower in order to get into this club, right? 
So in, in priesthood in Judaism is carried on the paternal line. In Judaism, if your father's a priest, you're a priest. If your father's a Levite, you're a Levite. In Roman Catholicism, not so much, because if your father's a priest, there's been a problem. So priesthood in Christianity is a vocation. Priesthood in Judaism is an inherited condition. So how do you get Jesus to be a priest? Oh, he's a priest in the order of Melchizedek, who in the succession line, there was only one other person, and that turns out to be Jesus. Jews are going, huh? However, when you go to the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's, there's, there's a text, we call it today 11Q Melchizedek. So 11 for cave, 11Q for Qumran and Melchizedek, because the text is about Melchizedek. Melchizedek was huge in the first century because he's just a weird character. Kind of like Enoch is huge in the first century because mm. he's a weird character in Genesis. So people latch on to these, these minor but fascinating figures, um, and then entire biographies are built up around them. So that's what Melchizedek gets you Jesus as high priest. It is funny that the after the order, there's only one succession and it's Jesus because it, it's not foreign to the thinking of a Christian or even possibly a Jew at this time. If we grant uh, what all the scholars are saying, Paul within Judaism. And the reason why I say that is Paul makes this. Can I use the term convoluted? Uh, I, he makes, let me just put it, he has an interpretation where he makes an argument against his Judaizing foes, if you can, on his audience in Galatians by saying, you know, uh, you know, it's the promised seed, not seeds, many, but yeah. one. And so here's this, Jesus is this Abrahamic seed. And if you're found in him, well, you're Abraham's descendants. And this is probably harping on this adoption idea that's in Rome at the time. And there's some interesting stuff there. My point is, is, is that kind of what they're maybe doing with Melchizedek and saying there's some spiritual priest priesthood in heaven. Uh, and here's Jesus, you know, the next successor of this heavenly priesthood. Um, I'm not sure it fits with your analogy to Galatians. Okay. When Paul says the promise was made to Abraham and to his seed, um, so Zera in Hebrew and sperma in Greek, but it's a collective, right? Like sheep. Um, right. And Paul takes the the plural, um, it, it's like your sperm, right? So you think about your sperm. This is interesting for your eyes. Think about your yeah. sperm, right? Normally people don't think about one particular sperm. You think about this you know, spray of yeah. sperm. It's probably more visceral than you'd, you'd want for your show. But in any case, so Paul takes the, the plural as a singular and says, and that becomes the Christ and you get in through the Christ. That's not quite the argument that's being made in the epistle to the Hebrews, but the idea of taking a text and kind of massaging it and adding to it, that's perfectly normal. Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls are doing more or less the same thing. And the best example there, which is not quite on the same track, but close, um, is to look at the Pesher commentaries for the Pesher Nahum and Pesher Habakkuk. Um, uh, so it's like, you know, Nahum said this, but we know what it really means because the teacher of righteousness told us that. And, you know, if you actually show this to Nahum, Nahum's gonna, probably going to go, what? <laughs> um, and, and that's okay. Um, there's a wonderful midrash um, about Rabbi Akiva, who dies in the Bar Kokhba revolt, says 132 to 135. Um, he's a martyr, right, about 100 years after Jesus. Um, and he's teaching in a school. And, and God says to Moses, you know, have you met my friend Rabbi Akiva? Fabulous. So God and Moses go to Rabbi Akiva's school and they're sitting in the back and Akiva's getting all this additional information and how come there were little crowns on some of the letters and the Torah. And, and Akiva says this all comes from Moses and Moses is completely flummoxed. Right? So the idea is that a person can write something and it can mean so much more than that person originally intended. And then somebody comes along and says, oh, it means this. And if you can get a sufficient audience, then it's instantiated. And that's what Hebrews is, in a way, doing, it seems. And you, you talk about supersessionism, which ties into this. It, it's yeah. very connected, but I'm glad you took the time to explain Melchizedek before we did, because he's a strange guy. He's a fun character to think about. He's also got a miraculous birth. I mean, you know, he's, he's just fun. Yeah, anyway. isn't it a miraculous birth because they don't mention a birth for him, and that's really why they think it's a miraculous birth? Well, it could be, but they don't mention a birth for um, – uh, Enoch. I mean, we don't have details. Um, so, you know, can you fill in? Sure, you can fill in. You know, he's Noah's nephew, and uh, his wife was not having sex with her husband because he was a priest. And, you know, if you're doing, if you're at the altar, you don't want to be sperming. Um, and suddenly she turns up pregnant and he accuses her of adultery, but she wasn't committing adultery. And then she drops dead. Uh, and then there's this kid who looks like a three year old dressed like a high priest. 
<laughs> okay, now the text is, is it goes along longer than that, but th those those are the basic plot lines. And you, where the heck did you get that out of Genesis 14? Well, it doesn't say it didn't happen. Mm. So the supersessionism in Hebrews, something to make note of. Uh, I've even heard it also coined as replacement theology to some yeah. degree. Um, there are some scholars who think Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, might be doing this as well to some degree. But okay. Hebrews takes everything and puts it in heaven. It even takes this weird passage. I say weird because when we think literally, uh, the way I've always interpreted our Bible, I'd read this Jeremiah passage and say the new covenant will be for the house of Israel, yeah. the house of Judah. And I know those houses from reading my Hebrew Bible as here's the kingdom of, of Israel and here's the king of Judah. And these are literal locale with literal people who had different tribes they're from, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But we get to the New Testament. Here he is. He uses the same thing. And he says, you know, the new covenant will be for the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And there's confusion. Even today, there's some people who will run off into different versions of interpretation and groups. And uh, they, they, there are even racist groups that yeah. will take this and say, well, these Gentiles, for example, they'll argue that they're uh, Christian identity groups, let's say. Mm -hmm. they, they go, we connect back ethnically to this. And if you look at these passages, it was for an ethnic group only. And they don't understand that the social identity markers of Israel have been now applied to a new people. And they are the fulfillment of tech in their interpretation, of course, of these Hebrew scriptures. So how would you like explain supersessionism and how that... <laughs> And you only have five minutes. No, I'm just <laughs> Supersessionism um, is the idea that all the promises that were given to Israel gets tr get transferred over into the Gentile church. And that's why it's sometimes called replacement theology. So the Gentile church replaces ethnic Jews. Um, if ethnic Jews want to join the Gentile church, then they, they go back into covenant. But they don't come in as Jews. They come in as, as no longer Jews or the Judaism part. Does, the Jewish ethnic marker doesn't count. Um I think the entire New Testament has supersessionist tendencies because it's salvation only through the Christ. Um, and then various Christians have worked out different ways of, you know, getting the Jews in. I think Paul expects Jews to remain Jews, but eventually to come into this Christ thing eschatologically. Uh, but they come in as ethnic Jews, retaining Jewish practices. Uh, the Gospel of Luke um, has no triumphal entry, right? So you get the triumphal entry where the crowds are like, Hosanna and King David and all in Luke, it's only the disciples. Jerusalem's like, eh, I'm so sure about this. Um, and Jesus talks about the time when Jerusalem will welcome its king. And that's that's like at the second coming. So um, if Jerusalem is going to do that, you need to have Jews around, qua Jews, in fact, living in Jerusalem to welcome Jesus when he returns. Uh, but the whole thing is basically, it's, it's salvation through the Christ. Okay, well, that's supersessionism. Does it replace the Jewish covenant or does it add to it? And that's why sometimes people will talk about supersessionism not as replacement theology. In other words, the Jewish covenant is still in place, but it's also salvation through the Christ. Um, and you can see hints of that actually in, in Roman Catholic thought, right? It's of course it's salvation through the Christ, but we, we affirm the Jews as Jews and, and God will take care of them or take care of us eschatologically. And other texts can be read as Jews, but you basically lost it. It's all salvation through the Christ. Um, and if you want to hang on to your Judaism, it's, it's kind of an accidental thing. It's like hanging on to your, your identity as a German or a Botswanan or a Mexican. Um, Christians today are concerned about this. Um, and a number of them are concerned about groups like Christian identity, um, who not only claim to be somehow biologically connected with King David, right? Uh, but they look at all Jews as descended from an Indo-Turkish group called the Khazars, um, which you know, completely well that you know how did they get to Yemen? Um, you know, so all all the the Mediterranean Jews and the North African Jews have nothing to do with this, um, as well as various biological studies about Jews who are connected as Jews and not as you know Polish people or Turkish people or whatever. I don't like these genetic studies; they make me very very nervous. But as an historian, I can see the continuity of Jews from the Second Temple period through the time of Jesus up into the mission to the Talmud to today. And that's an unbroken stream. Did some people convert in? Of course. Did some people leave? Of course. But is there people continuity? I think so. I think so, too. And I just think there's this drive for a lot of these groups, whether they be Christian identity, British Israelites, uh, there's black Hebrew Israelites, for example, that are on street mm -hmm. corners. They're the Hebrews and there's this com competition and argument. And I think they want that identity. 
and there's this blend of a mixture of interpretation i think that's happening it's it's almost like a modern concept dealing with racism that has happened has caused i think this this struggle of well i find ethnic uh, can i use the term ethnic supremacy in some sense like here's mm-hmm. a special people group from all the people of the earth yeah chosen and, people right i want to be chosen I want to be part of this. They're reading the clear clan tribal indications in Genesis where it's to their seed, their descendants, literally Abraham's. And mm-hmm. they take that literal and they don't see, I don't admit they're trying to force that into the new Testament and make them some su- somehow connected to this as their way of being, Oh, I'm, I'm chosen. You know, Calvinists still do that, but because I used to be one, uh, they'll do that, but they don't have to have ethnicity involved. They're like, you know, uh, look, I have faith because God elected me and sure. double predestination. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> so I just I just thought I'd mention that I think it's what you're doing is valuable because it actually is showing the distinction in interpretation and that people can c- kind of red flag and see this is a modern thing. Uh, very modern uh, concept. I mean, it's only a couple hundred years old that British Israelitism is really on the scene in that way. The development has been for longer, lo- searching for the lost Israelites, searching for which group they might be. You know, Joseph Smith did this, where he thought the Native Americans were these uh, lost Israelites and stuff, as you call them. But anyway. Oh, sure. Um, so the idea of co-opting somebody else's identity, that, I mean, there's nothing new there. Um, If a Christian wants to say, I feel like I'm part of Israel, I think in terms of the New Testament, there's warrant to do that. Um, uh, That the comments that you're making about Galatians about, so you get into the family of Abraham by adoption. And as you mentioned, adoption is really huge in the first century, because at least if you're adopted, your parents wanted you. If if you're, if you're born out of, out of your mom's vagina, that's kind of an accident to birth, right? So you get, you get whatever you get. So adoption can be looked at as really quite a positive thing, like Caesar, uh, Julius Caesar adopting Augustus, who's, who's not his biological child. Um, and I don't mind that. Um, what I do mind is the, and therefore Jews have no role here anymore. Yeah. Um, and that's where the replacement comes in. That's the dangerous stuff. Um, and I think it's also theologically problematic for those who believe in God, because it says God is not faithful to the divine covenant, right? Um, so God makes promises to Israel and then says, oh, the hell with Israel. Oh, I said it again. Um, let's, you know, let, let's go to the Gentile. What's up? Why not just say, in effect, the hell with, with the Gentile church and we'll go find some other group? Yeah. And this is where that strife that you're trying to connect here in the book, there's a tension that you're really doing a fine job, I think, pointing out. Because it's like you need the Jews. You need this literature. You need to understand or else you're cutting. You're, you're sitting on a branch and you're cutting the branch off. And – the Jews are typically looking at Christians and not empathizing. I don't think they're not really aware of, they're not giving a fair, I guess you'd say chance at understanding why they've come down this, this interpretive interpretive model, why they've come to these conclusions. And it's not just, and I'm not saying all Jews, by the way, I'm speaking for like the individuals who are involved in the engagement, like my friend, Rabbi Tovia Singer, you know, they're, these are my friends. So I just I think you do so good in this book trying to give people a perspective that they haven't really thought about. Right. So I don't think the way um, that you promote Judaism to Jews who might be attracted to Christianity, you're thinking, well, I really don't want my kid to convert and I'd really like my kid to remain Jewish, um, is not to say, well, here's what's wrong with the New Testament. Here are some inconsistencies I can point out to you or here are some other ways that you can read Isaiah Um, uh, or here's why the church. Basically, here's why Christianity is wrong. Um, you tell the Jew, let's learn a little bit more about your own Judaism before you want to add Jesus in. Um, What are you looking for here? Are you looking for spirituality? Well, here's some resources within your own tradition you might not have considered. Um, Are you looking for a better community, which is often the case? Well, how about this synagogue over here or this rabbi over here who might work for you? Um, So it works in reverse as well. I've had students who have said to me, gee, I th- I'm really interested in Judaism. And I think I want to convert. You know, can, can you point me to a local rabbi so I can start taking lessons? I said, I can do that. But why do you want to convert? You know, what is it about Judaism that you, fi- that you can't find in your own tradition? And granted, each tradition has strengths and weaknesses. But conversion, I mean, unless you're an orphan, um, conversion will mean something probably to your family. 
So you come from a good what Presbyterian household or a good Methodist household or a good Roman Catholic household, and you say, I think I want to be Jewish, and your mom's going, but you know, but I sent you to Sunday school, <laughs> and your dad's going, but I confirmed you. Um, it, it means something, because it means you're leaving part of a family, part of a group, part of the people. Mm -hmm. And don't do that. It's sort of like, I think I want to emigrate, right? Don't do that unless you're absolutely sure that what you're looking for is not already in your own tradition, but you don't know it. So one of the benefits of interreligious conversation, at least I found this for myself, is the more I study Christianity, the better Jew I become. Mm. So I find something that's really cool in the New Testament. They're really cool in, in you know, medieval Christianity. I go, yeah, I wonder where that is in Judaism. I wonder if we got that. You know, where, where's that that Sophia, that that feminine Holy Spirit? Oh, it's the Shekinah. Oh, we got that one. You know, um, where's the sense of spirituality in a system which is substantially legal? And they have all these Jewish mystics, like the mystics in Sfat. And oh, wow, that's really cool. Um, it's what Christopher Stendhal talked about when he talked about holy envy, that you look at your neighbor's tradition and go, but that's really interesting. <laughs> it's not mine, but I can learn from it. And I might find something similar in my own tradition that I did not know about because it's it's not like in 40 points. It's like in, in two point, but it's there. Wow. So go learn all that other stuff because it makes you a better you before you jump ship and, and become a better something else. Thank you so much. That's beautiful. I love the way you put that. Um, let me skip this next justice and mercy with Jesus. Just to point out, you really got to read the book on this because many Christians come along and they say, or, or many even critics, Jesus totally radically changed everything and he's anti-law. Nah. Read the chapter. Mm -hmm. yeah. You'll get a better idea. It's just something to look at. So human sacrifice. Yeah. This is a juicy one, right? Because there is precedence of this in the Hebrew Bible. So when I hear those who are against Christianity, uh, typically the Jewish uh, apologists who are saying, are you kidding me? It's an abomination. You can't, you know, human sacrifice is an abomination. It seems there are certain indications. And then there are some places where it happens and it even works. You point out. It and does. once, can you tell us a little bit about human sacrifice? And then we'll get into the whole Eucharist for a moment. Um, it, it, it was done on occasion. I mean, you, you get hints of it in Genesis 22, which is the Abraham and Isaac story. Um, Jephthah in Judges 11 sacrifices his daughter. You know, if I, if I, you know, Je Jephthah vows to God, if you let me win this battle, I'll, I'll sacrifice the first thing that comes out of my house. And when people say it's the dog, I'm thinking, no, I don't want my dog. I mean, and turns out to be his daughter. Um, it's a very, very rash vow. And the story is, it, it reads like a Greek tragedy where you get, Jephthah is a, a damaged individual. He's a traumatized individual because of his own background. And he winds up sacrificing the, the, the one other human being who actually loves him. Anyway, um, And then you have kings who are, who are killing their, their, the, the crown prince on the wall and, and then the tide, the tide of the battle. So, you know, only at the last minute do you do this. It apparently worked. Ooh. Um, we're certainly not doing it in the first century as far as we know. Right. Um, Jesus dies as a ransom for many, as Matthew and Mark puts it. So it, instead of thinking of him as human sacrifice, we might think of him as martyr. Um, the epistle to the Hebrews does use sacrificial language and talks about how much more potent his blood is than the blood of sacrificial animals like sheep and cows. Because right? people back then thought that way. Right? Um, when I think of human sacrifice today, I mean, we still do it. Um, so our, our, we let our kids go into the military and they're going to go sacrifice their lives to go protect, ideally to protect other people. Um, when people die today as martyrs, as some do, because they're trying to do the right thing. So we just had the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. That's a type of sacrifice. He knew his life was on the line. He knew people wanted to kill him. He's willing to do that. Um, so it helps us think about sacrifice. Today. So the question is, do Jews, do Jews need blood in order to have atonement? So that's the question. Why? Because the epistle to the Hebrews, which again, Jews don't read, says you have to have blood for atonement and Jesus gets you that blood. And now what do you do? Because your temple is destroyed and you haven't done animal sacrifices since about the end of the year 69 of the common era. I once had a fellow, this is years ago, say to me, Professor Levine, do Jews in urban areas need a zoning variance in order to offer animal sacrifice? It's an interesting question. Why? Because he had read Leviticus that talks about animal sacrifice. He had read the epistle to the Hebrews and he concluded, if Jews don't believe in Jesus, they must still be sacrificing animals. No. Okay. 
Um, even if you read Leviticus, there are certain cases where if you don't have um, an animal for sacrifice, you can use a grain sacrifice. When you get to the rabbis, they make a lot of comments about this. Is one rabbi that says um, the death of the righteous makes atonement for sin. Um, there's a hint of that in Second Maccabees when these seven sons of uh, uh, Jewish sons of a righteous Jewish mother are tortured to death for refusing to eat pork. Mm -hmm. There's a sense that their death is somehow efficacious for the people because then they can talk to God directly. Mm -hmm. So did they have this sense of the death of a martyr is righteous, a, a righteous martyr is efficacious? Sure. But are they thinking about like the blood of the cross or washed in the blood of the lamb to use a good kind of image from the book of Revelation? They're not going there. Wow. But in the first century, it kind of made sense. Sacrifice was, was common. Sacrifice was like the internet. Everybody knew that it worked. Everybody knew that blood functioned like a detergent because blood can purge sin. They weren't quite sure how it worked. Like, I'm not quite sure how the internet works, but it works. Right. Um, and then you have professionals. In antiquity, they're called priests. Today, they're called people at the genius bar. So, you know, it, when, when you need to do this thing, there's somebody who, who knows the ritual that will make it. It was perfectly common. So nobody questioned blood sacrifice. Today, it sounds kind of creepy. Um, because most of us aren't around animals when they are being slaughtered in an abattoir um, in, in order to get the, the food on our table. See, we I've been blood that way. Just, just something to think about with the death of Jesus. I've heard cognitive dissonance is like a big thing that's set in for like explaining why the Messiah dies. That they believe he's the Messiah and now he's died. It's like what the heck? So they're searching the scriptures. Uh, they have to think this is prophecy because they're living in the end. Jesus is an apocalyptic uh, teacher who's probably just like the rest of the Qumran sect and and Paul and everybody else. He's probably in the same vein. And these people are like, no, 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 this has got to be in my book. And, you know, they're searching. Do you think that that cognitive dissonance is what sets in for the death? Or how do you look at it? Do you think yeah. Jesus came out thinking, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to do some things and things are going to go south. So get ready. <laughs> I'm asking you all sorts of million dollar questions. Sure. Well, it sounds like you're talking about what's his name? Leon Festinger's when prophecy fails, right? So you, you it's, it's a socio the sociological reading on cognitive distance. You get into this movement, you're convinced something major is going to happen. Like you're, you're going to be rescued from uh, aliens or whatever it is. I don't remember the details and it yeah. doesn't happen. So what do you do when this, you know, the prediction of the end of the world doesn't happen instead of saying, oops, my bad. And you go back to, to your home, right? You, you start bringing in converts, right? That's the cognitive distance model. Um, I'm not sure that's what happened. Um, I mean, I see the appeal of it, but I'm not quite sure what happened. Um, I think that some people really saw Jesus. Now, could you catch it on a camera? Right. I don't know. Uh, but I think they saw something. And whatever they saw, or at least whatever one of them saw and convinced some others, um, it changed their lives. Because um, I don't want to look at them as hypocrites, and I don't want to look at them as somehow psychologically traumatized into thinking something just, you know, cuckoo. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think they actually felt something. Um, you can see things similar today um, for a variety of different people who suddenly wake up one morning and they feel this all-encompassing divine presence. And some of them are seeking, you know, when they're praying, you know, they're on their knees going, please appear to me. And some of them are just going to walk in through the woods and go, wow. Or they wake up one morning and there's this, I feel this peace that I've not known before. And I've known, I know lots of people to whom this has happened because they write to me and they tell me this. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think they're nuts and I don't think they're psychologically damaged. And some of them weren't seeking at all, but I can see the palpable transformation in their personalities. And that may have happened as well. And there might have been something, I think Jesus was really charismatic. Right. There were other healers, there were other teachers, but I think he had whatever it is that that and we, the Greek term charisma really fits here. That like you're in his presence and you feel like this is absolutely right. And he's speaking directly to me and I get it. Um, and I want to be with him and I want to be like him or I want to be him. And then how do I do that? And it wouldn't surprise me that that's how um, some of his followers felt about him. Hmm. Wow. Well put. Yeah, there's always something to look at here. And I I really was reminded of my grandfather who died a few years back when they went to the funeral. It was like he lived in New York, Cooperstown, New York, where the Baseball Hall of Fame is. And there was hundreds Joe of people. David Ortiz, by the way, who just got elected in. 
Oh, wow. I'm an old Red Sox fan. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, some random gentleman walked up and spoke and he says, I met Paul Lambert. I don't know how many years ago at the, uh, at the, where did you pick up your mail at the mail place? And he said, I don't know. Um, he said, um, Paul Lambert had it. And he says, I don't know what it is, but he had it. And it was just profound because it's like it. What is it? It's a thing. And we all know what it is because we all meet that person that stands out. And that seemed to be what you're implying there. And it's interesting to wonder because what would a guy like this make such an impact to the point where they would have remembered him? Right. Because this gets into people who want to think maybe he didn't exist at all. Or, you know, or there's people who think he did exist uh, full fledged, but they believe the whole narrative. At the end of the day, he had to have been at least impactful enough that he stood out beyond people like Judas the Galilean or other people who are apocalyptic at this time. Um, but they died out. Th their, their movement just didn't quite have the same impact. I don't know. I mean, it, it could just be the followers of him also had it. And so they ended up having an impact and this growth of the movement happens. Who knows? Of course, there's also the miraculous that people want to bring into account, but I'm personally a naturalist on those levels, so I, I try to factor in like Scooby Doo. What's behind that uh, mask there, sir? You know, I'm always looking. So sure. Well, I mean, I, Bart Ehrman has made a really good case that stories of miracles are really quite convincing. So even if if the miracle did not happen, the story happened, and the story can keep you going, um, which is in part the way the scriptures work. Anyway, so the story of the Exodus. Well, who knows about the history of the Exodus? People are still working on it. But boy, boy that story can keep you going. Um, and that story can give you hope, which is which is why people, enslaved people to this day, mm -hmm. are still appealing to that story. So to, to, to leave out the power of story seems to me to be a, a lack of historical imagination. Forget stories, read. Um, the, the idea that there's this multiple divinity thing in antiquity that we talked about. So could Jesus have become divinized, right? Sure, he's a vindicated martyr. So there are a bunch of categories into which he could fit in that time period. And today, those categories are just so weird to us that we either go, well, it has to be true because it really happened, or it can't possibly be true because stuff like that doesn't happen. Yeah, yeah. This... And that's, that's our quite bifurcated <laughs> worldview that people in antiquity really didn't have. I'm loving this conversation. So this I, I'm torturing you by having you on here nonstop. I have to ask one more question for the sake of brevity, because I really want to have you come back. And I don't want you to think, oh, it's the Smith Vision guy. He wants to talk for days and he doesn't know how to shut up. <laughs> I just love what you say. And the book really excited me. It, it sparked a new interest of wanting to dive into various ideas and from the Jews actually listen to them because I grew up in Christianity and the Christian interpretation. Now I'm really fascinated how Jews thought about these things and it's got me peaked. So I hope the same happens on the other end and everybody wants to find out more. My final question, I'm going to skip the son of man enigma and just Good. simply ask you about Jonah because son of man will get us lost in the weeds. Um, Jonah is a fun book. I really think it's hilarious. God chooses this guy who's who's like, yeah, I'm pro-Israel. He's like, it's like saying the modern day Republican and Democrats, okay? They, they, they hate each other. You, you can see it. And here he chooses this Republican, so to speak. It's even deeper because there's ethnicity involved. This, this is a whole people group. It's Their identity is even deeper. But nonetheless, he chooses him and says, hey, I want you to go to those bad guys, those people who treated you like absolute crap. I want you to tell them to repent. I want you to tell them to stop doing their wickedness. And I'm going to show them mercy. And he runs from God and <laughs> he's on his way out. Tell us about Jonah, interpretations of it. Maybe tell us what its original intent is, you think. And then interpretations of it by Jews and then Christians, how they understood it. We will try to do this efficiently. Um, there is a prophet whose name is Jonah ben Amittai. He lived during the reign of King Jeroboam II um, in the northern kingdom of Israel, where things were just fine. Um, the you know economic boom, but with any economic boom, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And Joseph Jonah is like this good nationalist, rah rah, kingdom of Israel. Right? Um, that's not mentioned in the book of Jonah. So that's re do we read the book of Jonah in light of this fellow? That's already an interpretive decision. All right. So Jonah Jonah gets called by God, and Jonah does what prophets really ought to do because prophets don't want to be prophets. Who wants to be a prophet? Your job as a prophet is to tell people stuff that they don't want to hear. Okay. 
And in fact, the only truly successful prophet turns out to be Jonah. The rest of them, not so much. Um, so Jonah hightails it out. He books passage on a ship to go to a place called Tarshish, which actually gets up a Jonah-Paul connection because Tarshish sounds like Tarsus, which it probably wasn't. Anyway, um, and he's trying to escape and he falls asleep in the ship and there's this major storm and the sailors, pagan sailors, like, what do we do? And they, you know, they pray to their God, doesn't work. Um, and finally, they think it must be Jonah's fault. So they wake up Jonah and they ask him who he is. And then we have a text critical problem about how he identifies himself. We'll skip over that. <laughs> And finally, Jonah says to them, listen, throw me overboard and everything will be fine, which is about as passive aggressive as you can possibly be. He's not going to, yeah, you throw me overboard. It's your fault because you're bad Gentiles anyway, and I'll prove it. Eventually, they, they they toss him. And then they make sacrifices to God, which is very nice. So Jonah winds up in the belly of a fish. And in chapter two, when Jonah is a very long prayer, which is basically a, a, a mashup of a bunch of other prayer lines that really don't fit. So, you know, when in doubt, throw a bunch of Bible verses together that you memorized in a sword drill. Um, eventually, the fish literally vomits him out on the dry land. Um, and he goes to Nineveh. Uh, I'm now in Jonah chapter 3. And he has a five-word in Hebrew sermon, which is basically repent, or in 40 days, the city will be destroyed. And then there are questions about, is it three days, is it 40 days, whatever. And the Ninevites, what's going to happen? Chapter 4. Um, the Ninevites repent. In fact, their animals repent, and they dress their animals in sackcloth, a little bit for nature images. And Jonah goes up on a hill, and he's watching all this. And he's pissed because he wanted Nineveh destroyed because Nineveh is the enemy. And by the way, in the next generation after this fellow Jonah ben, uh, ben Amittai, um, Nineveh, which is the capital of Assyria, uh, will conquer the kingdom of Israel. So this is one of those, gee, can we go back in history and kill you know this dictator or that? Is? Let's, let's take out Nineveh now so our country will be safe. Mm, interesting. And, he, and Jonah, who is the biggest kvetch, I mean, he's just really annoying. Um, God causes his giant gourd, the Hebrew actually says pumpkin, um, to grow up over him. So there's shade, but then there's a giant worm. Everything is big. And then there's a giant worm that comes and eats the giant gourd. And Jonah's in the sunshine. And the sun is really hot. And he starts complaining again. He said, it's better that I die, right? Because it's too hot. Um, and then God says, well, you know, what about the Ninevites? Um, you know, don't you care about them? You know, thousands of people plus the cows. And that's the end of the book. Oh, it's a weird book. And it's very, very funny. And it's clearly meant to be slapstick. Um, if you read the prophet Nahum, uh, the prophet Nahum celebrates the destruction of Assyria. So you have one thing that says the Assyrians can repent. Your worst enemies have the ability to be transformed. So think about you know positive relationships today with the Japanese who bombed Pearl Harbor. Uh, with the Germans and what happened during World War II. And then we, you can be friends. Right? Um, for Judaism, it's it's a book about repentance. Um, and it is read on the afternoon of Yom Kippur, the day of repentance. It's only four chapters, and Jews read entire books. Christians tend to read snippets. So you, you chant the entire book of Jonah because it's about repentance. If the Ninevites can do it, heaven knows you can do it. You're already in the system. Go do it. Right? Um, in Christianity, it becomes a symbol of resurrection because Jonah is in the belly of the fish for three days, ooh, three days, comes back up and preaches a message of repentance. So in the gospels, just as um, the son of man, son of man, wait, just as the son of man was, will be in the ground for three days and then be raised. And then there's a final judgment. So Jonah, and it, in antiquity, um, you begin to get Christian sarcophagi, this is after Constantine, um, and on their sarcophagus, images of Jonah. So you can mm -hmm. even see how Jonah works out in material culture. Church, Jonah, resurrection, synagogue, repentance. That's what I was to say. Yeah, Jonah is that image of resurrection. And does it have potentially anything to do with this Gentile inclusion we're finding as well? Like maybe it's a lesson of saying, you know, those who are not us uh, we're bringing in. Does it have any relevance to that, you think? I, th I think it does, but it's not the only one because the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, the Tanakh, has a motif known as the righteous Gentile. Um, and the righteous Gentile frequently pops in and does something that Jews are not doing. So it's Israel's way of saying, hey, look, even the Gentiles get this point, you know, get with the program, right? Your next door neighbor, it's my children's right, well, so-and-so, the next door neighbor <laughs> managed to get his homework done. Let me see I'm sorry. Right. And, you know, he doesn't have a, a mom who can read Greek. So, you know, why can't you get this done? Right. Um, so and the tradition of the righteous Gentile comes in. Um, I, I think Jonah can be and has been used for that. Uh, the mother of Moses, uh, the the Pharaoh's daughter. Right. She comes into rabbinic traditions. Batya, righteous Gentile. Ruth, righteous Gentile. 
the widow of Zarephath, who gets cited in Luke chapter 4, righteous Gentile. So there are lots and lots of them. But in the Jewish scriptures, the righteous Gentiles remain Gentiles. They can mm -hmm. affiliate with Israel. You only start getting conversion following the Persian period. Right. That's second temple. Yeah. Wow. Everybody right now, the end is nigh. You must go and get a book. OK, I'm a little apocalyptic about it. I think you really need to go and get a couple of her books. Seriously, though, on Audible, if you have the, the capability of just listening, you can do that. But the paperback's also wonderful. I highly recommend getting her books. I'm going to be going through them. So here's my encouragement to my audience as you saw how amazing this episode was, we're going to go through these books. I'm going to go through them. I want you to go through them with me and we will hopefully get Dr. Levine to come back on and we can go through these and have little uh, fun discussions about them, getting more people acquainted with the material because this is scholarship. Thank you so much for giving me your time, your energy, your enthusiasm. Like I said, there wasn't any like, I didn't have any order in particular, which I wanted to go with the flow and see where things would lead us. But seriously, thank you. Oh, what a pleasure to talk with you. Thanks very much. Um, and let's do it again sometime. Yes. Is there anything that I missed that maybe our audience should know? Oh, page after page after page. Um, think of it as you kept talking about how I'm a scholar. Yeah. And I suppose I am, but I'm, I'm also, I'm a communicator. Um, and to some extent, I'm a storyteller. I, I have such passion for this material and I want the passion to come through in the writing. Um, so I'm not inclined to use a whole lot of, uh, you know, multi-million dollar words like the, you know, the eschatological concern of the Perusia um, in light of Heilsgeschichte. I don't have to do that. I'm just talk like a normal person and say, this is really interesting stuff. Come journey with me and see how interesting it is. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, join us on this journey and never forget, <laughs> we are Myth Vision. <laughs>